Welcome to the Indie Beacon Show, where readers can discover great new indie authors. Find us on all major podcast systems and YouTube. Join Charlotte Cannon on today's show. Hi, I'm your award-winning host, Charlotte Canyon, and today our guest is Irene Barron. Oh my gosh, this is going to be so exciting. She's a teacher and author. She's also a pilot. We're going to ask her a little bit about that. And she just got voted the top female writer of the year 2020. Welcome to the show, Irene. Thank you, Charlotte. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for asking me. Um, first of all, I know our listeners will be very interested about your, uh, tell us a little bit about your background and, you know, your family and just a little bit of your history so we can kind of know where you came from. I grew up in Cleveland, Ohio until I was six and then moved to southeastern Ohio, which is down in hillbilly country, people say. Um, I have been in the arts since grade three. Um, my art teacher put something into the city art contest and it won, <laughs> won contests. Um, and the contest win was uh, lessons at the local arts center, which were just phenomenal. And I really enjoyed that. And so I just took them then from then on until I graduated from high school, um, classes all the time. So when that and I was into tennis sports, I was the girl athlete, I was on the junior tennis team and even later the city tennis team. Um, went to college when my father and mom said I could go to college. I said, all oh, right, I was so excited. I was still, I'm going to study art. And my father said, no, you can't study art. And I said, what do you mean? Well, then I'll study phys ed and teach phys ed because I love sports. And he said, no, I don't think so. And I said, well, if it's not art and if it's not phys ed, then what's it going to be? And he said, science or math? And I thought, oh my goodness, I probably flunk out in math. So the lesser of two evils <laughs> was science. So I took science. Uh, minored in chemistry, but I took ev every science there was possible, the beginning or maybe another class or two. So my spectrum of science was extremely broad. So I did teach for a little while and I was very bored with teaching, mainly because you can't meet anyone. You're working every night grading papers or something. So I thought, well, what can I do? And I met with a friend and he said, apply at the, the Town Memorial Institute in Columbus, which is a research institute. And they offered me a job as an information specialist, took me to London, England, and stayed. I stayed there with the um, World, what was it called, World Engineer Council. And they had classes on all types of things for writing, technical writing, science writing. So I could read a book and put that book in four words, much like they do on Google. You just da -da -da -da, put in a couple words and up comes all this material. But this was before computers. This was back during the Vietnam War. So I went from there to the um, Bangkok, Thailand, and I worked uh, when in counterinsurgency. There was uh, nothing there for the United States government as far as maps and information. If they had to come and help Thailand with the CETO agreement, which was in place at that time, um, they had no data. And the French were there and they, in Vietnam, and they, when they were there, they took it all, took it with them. So they had nothing for Vietnam when they went there. They had nothing for Cambodia or Thailand. And Thailand wasn't in the war at that time. And it was very interesting. I did the, the geology and the hydrology of the Mekong River uh, for the, uh, uh, it was a top secret classified book for the military. And uh, then I did the, I directed the aerial photography. Uh, we used Air America helicopters uh, that would be like run by the CIA. And I had a pilot by the name of John Moore, which I remember that because it's the same name as my uncle. I thought, oh, I'll never forget that pilot's name. So we had a grand time. It was like a two-story helicopter. You have to climb up on the outside of it to get in, go in through the window. And then in the lower level is where we had engineers. And they all had Pentax cameras. And I would tell the pilot, 
where to go and where to line up the plane, and then all these guys would click out this open window. They just had a, a rope around the window that was probably about this big around, or it was not a window, a door, and it, it just went there. And if, he had to be real careful because if he moved, those guys would all fly out the, the door. There was, there was nothing there but a rope, so it was kind of exciting. And they had a lot of fun, and so did I, because I went to every air base, every, every American military base in Thailand, um, sat on the flight lines, and when the phantoms would take off and put in the afterburners, just poof, power just all over the place, noise. And I just, when they would go by, they would go by, and then they would pull the bombs, these red, red flags. Once the, once the flags were pulled, the bombs were armed, and then they would go down a little bit more, and then, then they would take off, and right at, I sat, I knew where to sit, <laughs> especially in Corral or some of those bases. And I would sit right where they put in the afterburner. Whoa, that was power. And that's when I thought I'd better become a pilot. It was so much fun. So I uh, became a pilot eventually, and it's fun. It is. It's, it's a rush. People say, why do, you, why do you like to fly? I say, well, how much fun can you ever have? It's just great. I think anyone should give their kid a, a, a lesson in a uh, piloting, they can become a pilot at age 14. I was much older, <laughs> but it was fun. And do you have any questions about my background? Well, no, that was intriguing. I, I can kind of equate, I've not flown an airplane, but I've jumped out of one. <laughs> oh, I would never do that. And that's a little bit exhilarating in itself. <laughs> <laughs> they said, never, never jump out of a perfectly good airplane. <laughs> I know that's what my brother said. Don't jump out of a perfectly good airplane. Yeah. When did you start writing? I mean, I know that you were also a, a, an accomplished photographer, but when did yeah. you, when did you start writing? Well, I was doing the aerial photography, um, and I did get a national award in that through Smithsonian. It was it was a uh, one first place in what was called the Americana division. The national flags were in Zanesville, and they were having one flag at the courthouse. And I went up to the man who was running it, and I said, may I take aerial pictures of your flag? And he said, yes. And he said, maybe we can arrange another shot. And so in Zanesville, we have a wide bridge that connects two rivers. And he lined up four fantastic flags. And these flags are bigger, about as big as, well, how would you say? Take about 150 people to hold each one up. Be and that. if you go to your website, you can see those because I saw yes. those today. Yes. yes. Oh my gosh, that was amazing. Yeah, and and on Twitter, I put that on my banner. But it it was really fun to uh, do that. And the fellow that that normally flew me for my aerial photography because you have to have a professional pilot. You're not allowed to fly yourself and take pictures if you have a contract. He wasn't available. He was out of town, so I had to get John Graham, uh, who was a pilot out of Dresden, Ohio. He has his own airport, and we just had a ball. He he took he was so neat. He took the door off of the Cessna, so that I didn't have to go through a window. <laughs> it was beautiful, and the people were very afraid because I I was you know long I was strapped in pretty good, but I would lean out because we would go in circles. You had to stay so many feet above the. The ground when you're in the city but this was over a river so i could we could get down a little bit lower and everyone said they were afraid that i was going to fall out <laughs> they could see and the wind was blowing my hair and it was, and it was just a delight it oh was, my gosh irene you've got such an exciting life and i know that you impart a lot of this in your books but we're going to take a break and let our let our sponsors do their thing all right thank you Hello, I am the author Denise Bryson. My first book is The Things That Crossed My Mind, Inspirational Poetry with Life Lessons. And then my audio book is Love's Reality. And it is also inspirational poetry with a jazzy flair. And then my new book is The Sex, The Lies, and The Soul Ties. They're really short stories uh, written from a poetic uh, expression. And then I have my first children book series, the Blinky series, which the first book is called Meet the Coins, and it is both in English and Spanish. And then the new book uh, from Coins the bills. I am the author, Denise Bryson. Marianne Fairmouth is a career consultant with 30 years experience in the national recruiting world, a multi-award winning author in multi-genres, and a speaker that gives presentations to help you succeed. Her book, 
Revolutionary Recruiting made the top 20 global list of recruiting books. Find her on Amazon, your favorite bookstore, or at Fairmont.com. To embrace your children's imagination, check out Diane Floyd Bames' books for kids. There's The Moonling Adventures, all about the animals in the Serengeti. And then there's Harry the Camel, learning to love yourself just the way you are. Then the little girl in the moon. There's one about friendship, another one about the big ideas, which is an inspirational story. And then tour Tycho Town, right there in Tycho Crater on the moon. All of Diane Floyd Bang's books are available at B for R store. Welcome to the Indie Beacon Show, where readers can discover great new indie authors. Find us on all major podcast systems and YouTube. Join Charlotte Cannon on today's show. This is Charlotte Canyon, and we are speaking with Irene Barron. Oh my gosh, if you've missed the first segment, you you just got to catch up. Irene has uh, been a pilot, a teacher, an author. She's a mathematician, you know. Uh, she told us kind of because her dad pushed her into it. But Irene, you, you have an adventure, and, and we're going to talk about your books here in just a second, but you had something happen at NASA. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Oh, with NASA. Oh, yes. That's exciting. Can you see this behind me? This, yes, ma'am. Here. This was, the, the year was published, was considered the best Christian education book of the year. I received several years earlier from NASA, and let's say I taught astronomy for many, many years, and I was always writing to NASA or calling, do you have this, do you have this, you know, they would send me pictures or even slides off the moon, just wonderful things, and um, one day I came home from teaching, I taught high school science, astronomy, or science, and when I did, there was a package, and I looked inside, and it had, remember the black floppy disks that, could, that you could move the disks? And it had 30 of those, and they were all NASA astronomy computer programs. And I thought, wow, I didn't know they even existed, and I got them free. <laughs> and the return address said NASA JPL. And so I called to thank them, and they didn't know anything about it at the education center or any place else that they checked in. So I thought, well, I'm going to use these anyway. And I took them to school and I had, I was going to have students when they were in study hall, they could come slip in quietly into the room and use some of the computers very quietly with those NASA programs. So the next day when I came home, there was another package and there were 38 more computer programs. I had 68 NASA astronomy computer programs. And I called them again. I said, thank you for these programs. And they had no idea what I was talking about. And I, so I sent them information of what they were. And they were, for an astronomer, it would be, you know, simple stuff. But I think they didn't know what I was talking about. So I thought, well, besides having my students use these, I wanted to use them to find the Christmas star. I am a, a very religious person. And I always wondered about it. And I thought, how could you ever find it? Because that was over 2,000 years ago. So I thought, well, I'll use these programs. And I did. And it took a long, it took several years. Because I first started with that. Um, the, let's say astronomy is very mathematical. Everything that happens, it's going to happen so mathematical you can predict years in advance when something is. So the wise men could predict years in advance, and they knew years in advance what this star was. And the actual Christmas star was a GPS marker type of thing. It was a marker. And before that, I discovered nine other announcements, who this God was, how powerful this God would be, and many other things so that the last one number 10 was just the marker that's where he was going to be born so now if you were a wise man and let's say anyone that had a kingdom or a, a land of some kind or principality they might not be the brightest person but they wanted the brightest person to 
to give them advice. And that's the astronomers. And even today, the, your, your astronomers are some of the most brilliant people ever. Maybe out of 10,000 math students, there might be one that might be good enough to become an astronomer. So they knew years in advance also all of this was going to happen. And they let their rulers know, and they had to plan. We need, we need to go there because diplomatically, in case there's a war, we want this God on our side. Right? So they had, they had reasons, they had political reasons to go there. And then they had to decide, you know, what do you wear? What do you take? What kind of gifts do you give? And they were expecting some huge mansion or castle or who knows what for this God to be born because it was going to be the greatest God in the universe. So the Bible gives clues as to where they were from and from what I was learning. Um, Many of the symbols, well, let's say all of the symbols, over 4,000, I mean, they just go on and on, were Babylonian. And the Bab Babylon um, is in Iraq, was in Iraq, uh, probably near where Baghdad is, maybe about 80 miles south, I think, I can't remember exactly. And these people were brilliant. They just, they, they discovered trigonometry. They, they discovered the angles. When you do 360 degrees as a circle, that was the Babylonians. I mean, they were absolutely brilliant. And well, in the Christmas star, do you share how people can, can they read that and kind of see what you're talking about? Well, let me do this. This, this is the only copy I've got right now. All the rest I've sold or I, have, I need to order them. I've had, let's say, age 12 and up could read this very easily. And I had one lady that was 90, over 95 years old. And she said, she thought it was going to be so hard. And she said, I impressed myself. She said, I understood everything in the book. She said it was fascinating, just fascinating. And in the book is a lot of astronomy also. So if, when you um, read the book, I will have diagrams like you can see this one. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, but these are diagrams that I made being an artist. I just did them freehand because I don't know computer graphics. <laughs> I wish I did. It would make things a lot easier. So all of the diagrams in here are mine. And then they had sections in here. Um, let me see. For each event, and uh, this, this was an early one and I didn't have that. In the later ones, for each event, I had a diagram showing what the stars looked like in the sky for each thing that happened. Well, I know we've concentrated on your, your, your pilot. Now, tell us a little more about your other books. I know you've got, you've got a, I think it's called the Mind Reacher series, and then you've yes. got Mary New. Yeah, behind me is the Mary New uh, picture. That's a larger picture of the cover. And that book, I, I found the sacred texts online, which have the ancient texts for every single religion. And if you want to learn about religions, that's one of the ways to do it. And I took world religions in college, which is one of the reasons why Battelle hired me. They said, because you would be working in a land of Hindu and Buddhism, Hindu and Buddhists, and you need to understand and not be upset with them. Well, that didn't bother me. Um, so in... Uh, in the Mary New book, there, there was this song on the radio, Mary Did You Know? Do you remember that song? Yes, ma'am. It's a beautiful I've done song. It. But when I heard that, I thought, that makes her sound like she was totally ignorant of everything. And my goodness, this lady, her parents, and this starts with her parents. This is from Apostle James, who was the youngest son of Joseph. And he lived with them, and he was at the birth of Christ. And he told, starting with her parents, all about her. Her parents were only allowed to have her for three years. They were told by angels what her name would be and who her son would be, that he would be the Savior of Earth, and he was to be named Jesus Emmanuel. And then we added the Christ later, Jesus Emmanuel the Christ. But she was allowed to stay with her parents for three years. He was extremely wealthy. Um, they had to make a sanctuary in their home for her because she wasn't allowed to hear any noises on the street. She was not allowed to hear profanity, screaming, arguing, nothing. Um, she had to be pure. 
And so on her first birthday, she was introduced to all the priests in Jerusalem. And from then on, she was famous throughout Jerusalem and, and throughout Galilee. At age three, she went to live in the Jerusalem temple for over a decade. And she was fed every day by angels who came to visit her. And the priests say they never had so many visitors at the Jerusalem temple. Everyone was trying to get a glimpse of an angel. Yeah. And she never left the temple. So she never heard anybody in the streets. Never heard any of it. Irene, we're going to have to take another break here. Okay. Because, you know, I, it, you, you just have fascinating stories. Stay <laughs> tuned. We're going to let our sponsors take a short break okay. here. That time went fast. <laughs> Publishing Marketing Package for Authors, a $1,500 value, save 40% now. Includes a six-piece marketing kit of 250 bookmarks, 250 business cards, 250 postcards, one table banner, one table runner, and 50 download cards, plus book cover design, ebook creation, PDF setups, upload to Ingram Spark, squirrel placement, video commercial, and interview on IBS, plus much more. Email bourgeoismedia at look.com for details or bourgeoismedia.com. Hi, I'm Mel Greenberg, author of Running With Our Eyes Closed, book one in the Empty Nested series. To the world, Samantha has the perfect life. Three wonderful children, a loving husband, so she thought, and a life split between Dallas and Italy. When her youngest leaves for college, it all comes crashing down, forcing Samantha to re-examine everything. Over seven days in one of the most romantic countries in the world, Samantha faces the past she thought she'd overcome and begins to redefine her role as a woman, a wife, and a mother. What would you do if you had to put your life on hold to care for a loved one? Well, during COVID, almost all of us have been doing just that. I'm Charlotte Canyon, award-winning author, actress, and speaker. And my book, you have to laugh to keep from crying, shows you how you can revive, thrive, and survive with four golden rules. You have to love one another. You have to respect one another. You have to have patience with one another. And most of all, you've got to forgive one another. I'm Charlotte Canyon, and I approve this message. Welcome to the Indie Beacon Show, where readers can discover great new indie authors. Find us on all major podcast systems and YouTube. Join Charlotte Cannon on today's show. This is Charlotte Canyon, and we're speaking with Irene Barron. Now, if you've watched the show, she's just got fascinating stories. She's been all over the world. She's done things with NASA floppy disk, and I don't think some of y'all remember what floppy disks were. Irene You've got a new series out, and it's called Mind Reacher Series. Can you give us just a little synopsis, and then let our people know how they can reach you? I'm sure you are you speak in the public as well as, you know, have your books out there, and where they can find your books. Thank you, Charlotte. This book, Mind Reacher, is like none you have ever read. People say I'm like Michael Crichton, reborn or something, because it's so different. Um, it would be similar to Indiana Jones, Clive Kessler, maybe a mix between those, people think. Um, it is extremely interesting. People say, I had one fellow a week ago was listening to the Audible. He said, in my life, I have never heard a book this good or read one. And I had one lady that was like 70 years old, and she said, I've never read a book. I always skimmed it. But she said, with Mind Reacher, I'm reading every single word. <laughs> that was kind of fun. But I do have a website, mindreacher.net. My home web website is irenebaron.com. The Baron is one R, B-A-R-O-N. So if you look up irenebaron.com, you're going to find a mass of things on Google or on Internet searches. I do have a blog about many things, mainly science and astronomy, uh, but it, it is, uh, a cult, let's say, many, many different things, and it's on the website. List of awards, uh, some things about Mary New. The, the home page has the three main books, and the second book should be out next year. Um, I'm waiting for the uh, artist. He's in Colombia where there's a war going on with terrorists, and they're hiding in the mountains, starving, he said. But he's still working on the cover for number two. <laughs> like, oh, good. <laughs> but people can reach me at 
on my website. There's a place down at the bottom of each page where they can send an email, where they can join a newsletter list. And my email is irenebaron at irenebaron.com. That simple. Um, but, um, well, Irene, it, it, could you give uh, maybe in a sentence or two a little advice to someone who's starting out writing or someone who's just, you know, just wants to live a life like you live? What, you know, what advice would you give them? I think my advice was uh, or would be to write what you know. Now, everything in here, people say, wow, you did all that. And a lot of things in here I did with the counterinsurgency or um, anything I wrote in school, it was always personal things that I experienced. But if you know something, then you can write about it. And if you don't know about it, then you need to go do some research. The internet is a wonderful place to do research, but the reference librarians at a public library can help you find books that are so old, you can't even find them in your library. It's just phenomenal how the library can help you. So I highly recommend research if you don't know the topic and have fun writing. And if it's not any fun, then you are doing something wrong. <laughs> a lot of people do poetry. I can't, I'm not a poet. To, do a, to be a poet, you have to have so many words up here. It just, it boggles me that that happens. So, um, Irene, this has been fabulous. Thank you again for joining our show and for all of your wisdom that you have imparted on us. And this is Charlotte Canyon, your host. And I want you to remember, a rose is like a book. You can't know its beauty until you look at it. And a book is like a rose. You won't know its full beauty until you open it. Until <laughs> next time, this is Charlotte. Bye for now. Thank you for watching or listening to The Indie Beacon Show, produced by Dion Bourgeois for the Authors Marketing International LLC, copyright 2021. It's over by Dion Bourgeois. If you would like to be a sponsor of the show, please email us at authorsmarketing at outlook.com. If you would like to be on the show, please complete the form found on our website at indiepeacon.com. You may also watch previous shows on the website. Music is Bollock of Words, created for Indie Beacon, 